let's talk a little about a little bit about Torah Eretz Israel, just an idea. What does it mean to anybody here? Aside from Rabbi Barachim says, what does it mean to you guys? Does it mean anything? Does it, does it does it affect you in any way? Does it matter? Yeah. The concept, the idea, I think the, the ideology perhaps. There's a lot of talk about it. It's it's used in other contexts. Rabbi Barachim didn't coin the term, but I guess he has his own use of it. To me, it means one of uh, a number of things, but it's actually quite important now for our day and age. I'll explain. Um, the first thing is going back to the sources to look at the trees, forest and trees muscle, which is a very good muscle for sorts of things. So the trees is, for example, uh, that whole thing we talked about wearing your talus all the time. I mean, it's filling all day. Going back to the source and say for this particular halachic issue, this topic, we're trying to get back Doesn't tell me I'm disconnected, but it doesn't tell me I'm I'm connected to Wi-Fi either. Hold on one second, guys. To be honest, I wouldn't have a computer if not for my wife. When I was a bucker, all I owned was my shaver and a clock radio. And uh, since before I met my wife, I haven't had much use for the shaver. So, uh, you know, and, and the clock radio doesn't work here in Israel. I had my, was my books, you know. Um, but my wife worked as a designer. So to work in graphic design and like serious artistic things, you need, you need Mac products. So this isn't, a, this isn't a commercial. It just happens to be that everything I have come from my wife. So I'm using iPhone and a Mac and she has two Macs at home and everything has to be Mac in order to like work. And I'm computer illiterate. I wouldn't know how to use a PC and stuff like that. Anyways, uh, enough about me. Um, so this is the tree. This is the trees, right? Tchelis is a tree. Should you be wearing your, it's, it's just like that. Yeah, you should. How should you tire Tchelis? That's a, uh, you know, a question. You know, I, everybody's opinion is evolving because it's a relatively new thing. And uh, all the other halachas you, you hear about, how to daven, that's a tree type of thing. By the way, uh, with regards to New South Eretz Israel, when we lead a minyan, because the Seder itself is evolving, you saw that, that for the Shabbaton, they just printed up new ones and it's constantly evolving. The, the Sidur that I have is the first edition of the Sidur Eretz Israel and changes that have been made since then already. So what do you do if you have a group of people that aren't ready for this whole, give everybody a brand new Sidur right now? What do you do? So just stick with Ashkenaz. But you tell people, you know, there's a lot you could leave out. Sometimes in Sidur you can, etc. So that's what I do as a default, so as not to, let's say, confuse my neighbors. And that's a good thing to do. Why do we do this? Because then there's the forest view. What are we trying to accomplish with the Torah to Israel? Well, at least what, what would I try to accomplish with that? For someone older than you. Well, Ahdud is a necessary component for what? Yeah, national goals also. We have, we have something to do as Am Yisrael. I know that I made a joke today to some of the guys learning there. I said, what's the opposite of Ashkenazi? And it's Sephardi. If we keep just that basic idea that there's two major groups and there's two halachas, I, I see questions put out to the groups of Rabbanim online. An Ashkenazi who does this, can he do it for a Sephardi? Is it better if the Ashkenazi doesn't do it, make the Sephardi do it for him? It's like a Shabbos guy almost type of thing. You've seen questions like these also. It's as though, you know, Jacob had three sons, Ashkenaz, Farad, and the young son, you know, the, the, the Binyamin of the group, uh, Taman, right? And that doesn't account for all the other groups that have existed throughout history. It's kind of weird. And it's obviously not something we're trying to do. So that, that's one example of something. Achdut is a goal that we're trying to achieve. By the way, we have a holiday celebrating this thing. Where used, they used to think that the tribes have to remain so separate that intermarriage between the tribes is kind of bad, right? That's what Tuba is about. It seems that that was something they realized just after Yeshua died, that it wasn't so usher. But they had this view, uh, a primitive view, that is a Judaism primitive. They hadn't gotten used to keeping the Torah yet, and they thought that this is something that's necessary. They thought it was because Moses was the last thing he said, it's just, you know, it's a mitzvah. You finish the book of Bamidbar, you notice that Moshe Rabbeinu came down and said, not just Benos Slavchad, everybody has to 
make sure to marry within the tribe. If you, a girl inherits, she marries within the tribe, right? Where's that halacha brought? Is it brought in Shulchan Aruch? Does the Rambam mention such a thing? For you, sir. It's for you, but does, was it ever practiced? A woman inherits. What do you mean? They, there's even the Gemara that says that Pinchas himself inherited property from his own wife, who was from the other tribe, and that's how he ended up having owning owning land. So what's it talking about? Was this ever a halacha actually? It's a Gemara in Bava Basra. And the answer is, it really wasn't a halacha. Otherwise, the or anything like that. Otherwise, it would be counted as a mitzvah of some sort or, or an actual halacha. You'd be able to find it. But it was good advice, basically. It was good advice. And when they realized, then, then the Chachamim then told them, no, this is not a halacha. You could marry between the tribes. Anybody can marry anybody else. As long as they're Jewish, that was a yanta for them because they were so mistaken about this. So Achtus is one of the necessary factors for us to achieve what we're trying to get at, our national goals of keeping the Torah, making it mamlech uh, uh, go goy kadosh. That's what we're trying to do. And the Torah, it's just all out, allows us, is, is a, actually at least one of many tools, necessary tools, that allows us to achieve what, what we're trying to get to. That's why it's important. But also we can't, uh, I used to, I used my brand for, for this farm. I started a publishing thing based on a, a name that came up with, with the local Rebetzin, Torah Lama'ase, which for me is something also very important, a factor that doesn't get discussed that much, and that is doing it yourself, DIY. What is it? What do I mean by that? Who, you tie your own scissors? Um, I tied my uh, this pair actually. Okay. You just two, just a pair. What about the backside? Uh, I mean, it's uh, the set <laughs> I tied. Oh, good. You guys also tie your own scissors? Good. You have to learn to do it. What? What are you gonna say? Yeah. Good. You write your own tefillin. You tie your own tefillin knots at least. Well, you, okay, good. You learn to do it yourself. Good. But the point is, you want to do these mitzvahs yourself. Too much Torah study, especially, let's say, in, in the yeshivas, is, you know, uh, lishma. By the way, lishma doesn't mean just learning for the sake of learning. It means learning for the sake of keeping and passing on. So you want to do it yourself. Why Why give it to someone else to do? You guys went pot shopping for Lulu Vanessa this year? I, Were you, uh, who's in Eretz Yisrael already in, in Yisrael? Years ago, you went, where'd you go? to the Zupnik uh, market? Yeah, it's oh, Okay, that's nearby. And there's like a, lots of selection and stuff. Yeah. So one of the things, I, I did that my first year. I made a determination, I'm just going to grow my own. And I, I don't pay for Lulav and Esrog anymore. You saw my Esrog tree? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I'm hoping that no one's going to come and take my Esrog. What? Thank it? God, no one's taking the two Esrog off the tree. It's I'm down to two months. I'm going to pick it in, in Elul so it has Kedusha Shvias. Because if you if you pick it late, you know, it's technically Busser Lee Kinkas, so it, it you know, follows when you pick it. But I don't, I don't want it to leave it on the tree too long because it's technically Hefka right now. Just glad no one no one knows to take it. Let them take my grapes. They're ready. So, and also have Lulav growing on the tree. I have Hadassim and, and, and uh, right right across the way. And, and Aravos are growing nicely. Do it yourself. Make your own matzah. Yeah, oh yeah, make your own matzah. That's we great. Where did you wait? You did you do it in your own facilities? Yeah, correctly, yeah. yeah good. Uh, we got uh, wheat berries or whatever they're called. Wheat, wheat berries. Wheat, 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 they're kern grains. 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 The kernels, yeah. yeah you, you ground it yourself. Ground them up. They call it the grinder. Wow, that must have taken a long time. Yeah, they need to sort it out. I I wasn't yeah. for the sorting tool. Now we have to do the sorting. And I make sure there's terrible. no sprouting because that could be. Uh, yeah, it could be wet. Uh, yeah. They found some kidney oak. Wow. Oh my goodness. Couldn't you guys just go get some flour from the matzah bakery, like the rest of us? <laughs> but there's no, they don't bake matzah in, in, in California? Okay, yeah, it makes sense. But there's no matzah bakery nearby. Berkeley, what, what major season it near? And there's no matzah in San Francisco? There are almost no Jews in San Francisco. Not anymore, at least. Yeah. There used to be Jews in San Francisco. I can, it's understandable why they would have left, you know, San Francisco, obviously. Okay, so look, you could thank God here. There's two, there was two matzah baking operations on this yeshuv alone. I was always able to get flour. So yeah, so do it yourself. Do it yourself. That's an important thing. To, Jews live in the mitzvahs nowadays. Jews used to have an agricultural society. This whole thing about the mikvah, the, the parsha of the mikvah, the girls going to mikvah, that was never a, que a question. You know why? Because everybody had to go to mikvah. You were involved in preparing food in the kitchen at certain times a year if you're the Kohen's family, or you want to be able to give your truma properly to the Kohen, you have to what? Go to mikvah all the time. And your mikvah has to be open. You have to have a family mikvah. 
That was something they used to do. We weren't disconnected from these things. Connection to the mitzvahs actually keeps us connected to reality. It's not the other way around. Like the reality, our reality now disconnects us from the mitzvahs, unfortunately. Someone else, we outsource our mitzvah observance. Someone else processes our meat. Okay, fine. Maybe that's, that's more hygienic. That's cleaner. But you know what happened? It used to be, in the olden days, women salted their own meat at home. And you could still buy, when I made Aliyah, you could still buy unsalted meat in the stores. It was 100% kosher, but you had to salt it yourself. I always wanted to do that at home. My wife didn't let me. Okay? That's too much for her. But I remember the first time we salted meat, that's something you have to do. You have to know these halachas. It used to be something you could do. It says the Talmud Chacham knows how to, you know, write, you know, write stom and knows how to not just stom, mean, you know, write sifri, you know, they're filling and things like that. And he also knows how to do shrito. So you have to learn to do it yourself. Is something very important. And the disconnect of Jews from actually doing means that, for example, just like we outsource the production of our tefillin and tzitzis and our food, means we can outsource the even the, the most important mitzvahs, which is, let's say, to build a state in the mikdash. We outsource that too, right? And we outsource even, even national security or an army. We say, who's supposed to be in the army? Anybody but us, right? Any of you guys enlisting, by the way? What? When are you going to enlist? Seven weeks? Seven months. Oh, okay, you got time. But that's good. It's not an advocate for everybody going to the army. So they, they do they do things that are like questionable. But a lot of guys are able to do it, and it's necessary. A necessary evil. But what's this question for? Uh, I, I know maybe the, yeah, you would yeah. agree with the thing like Big Bill you said, but yeah. on the army, uh, army, army thing, I, I think that there is something to say about uh, anyone uh, but us. The reality is the army of, uh, of today is largely a social program. Yes. It's me- meant to make people into Israelis, and specifically Israelis as opposed to Jews. And this is like a, a, just a well known, and that's why I, don't, I never encouraged anybody when I was involved in Hezri Yeshiva. I'm glad it was partial Hezri. I don't think they should push everybody for the army, especially if, unnes- if it's not necessary. In the olden days, sometimes it was. They needed every hand they could get, every hand they could get, every man they could get. Sure. Nowadays, it's it's 100 not true. If you're going to be real crovy or you're doing something really serious for national security, go ahead, join the army. I know some guys. It was pointless and useless that they were in the army. They did not need them. And only that the army has to develop a little more of a moral background. Aside from the fact that, like you said, it's it's a cultural melting pot run by someone else to design what he wants or what they want. They also sometimes take soldiers' lives at risk, put them at risk unnecessarily instead of just doing the smart thing and attacking the enemy. So you have to watch out. I'm not trying to take, uh, dissuade you from, from enlisting, but you can understand why it is I'm not saying you have to enlist. There's some people who say that. They even use rabbinic authority to say everybody has to serve. It's not true. But you know, the, the army just has to do it, do it better. And certainly, we don't need women at all in the army, which is obvious. So they shouldn't be anywhere near girls in the army. It's that's v'yamach necha kadosh means that there are no women around. That's a very important thing. So watch out. Uh, and most importantly, no arrogance. This thing that we could fall into. Sometimes, so uh, we pronounce Hebrew properly. You know, you wear your tailis differently. You know, you're confident in something that you're doing. Don't ever mock or make fun of, or let on to anybody that you think you're superior in any way, because you're not. You're just doing things because mostly when you're, when you're this age, you're a hanger on. The way to know if someone really is serious about whatever he's picked up in Judaism at this age is to see what he's doing 10 years on, 20 years on, okay? It's good that you guys already, let's say, went to Harabais. That's amazing. That's a good thing. But you go back to yeshiva, you don't have to talk about it with your friends. The Rosh Hashiva is like, what are you doing? Well, what's this high mai? They did to the Gra also. His own father told him, why are you doing things differently? You don't have to stick out. So you know how to pronounce Hebrew properly. Shkoyach. A lot of people will never get that. They'll, they'll, they'll live their entire life and they'll say, Elihaini. They know that's wrong. Okay? What are you going to do? Don't rub it in anybody's face. Don't think you're any better than anybody else. Look, they're following their Rebbein. Lead by example. It's good if someone hears you Let's say read the Torah properly, and he wants to learn something from you. You read the Torah? No? Okay. It's good to learn to read the Torah. It'll, it's, it's good practice. Learn the diktuk. Learn, learn the trup. That's a good thing. But lead by example. Don't, don't try to impose anything on anybody. And thank God, there's now the, your generation. By the way, I say your generation. You know why? Because when I was in yeshiva, you guys had barely been born. 
So now one generation has passed, one generation yeshiva terms. When I was in yeshiva, you couldn't do any of these things. Nothing, nothing like this was happening. So now it's happening. So that's a good thing. So you guys, you're not leading by example, your students. Now you guys are chaverim. That is, Am Yisrael to go together into Eretz Yisrael. 600,000 men, they all have to fight together. Some people are like, no, we're backing out here. What does that do? Well, yeah, it hurts morale also. I mean, some people don't want to go, so no one's going to want to go, right? The most amazing thing that you guys are doing is, look at that. There, there's five guys sitting right here who went to Harabais. When I was here, there was no one. That wasn't the thing that could be done. So yes, there are, there are leaders who are telling you to do that. You went with a man who's significantly older than you today. Were there other people who are older along with Rabbi Arfim today? Anybody in like a leadership position? Rabbi Siskind was there. Let Rabbi Levy. He's also younger. I don't even, maybe he's 30. But the fact is, you guys are doing it together. That's an amazing thing. You have more friends, bring them along. They have a whole yeshiva going, Tarabais. That's a good thing. That's a yeshiva of leaders. They're actually going ahead with this. There's a lot of opposition, you should just know. Here there's opposition. There's opposition all over the place. And you know what that opposition indicates? In two words. You're right. Okay? Because depending on what you're doing, how people... You show me a man, show me a man's enemies and I'll show you the man. What's the opposition from? It means you're doing something good. But don't, don't get too hung up on it. And the last thing is a uh, with, with Hashem. Who was say Levait Halech or Hit Halech? Hanoch walked. Or et Elohim. And who else who had a commandment to walk with God that way? Does it mean to walk by the way? Hitalech. What's it between Hitalech and Lalech? Well, one's reflexive, yes. So which one? One's one's uh, intransitive, I think. Lalech means because you walk. You don't walk something. The transitive would be to walk a dog. You just walk. Lalech means to walk. Walk with God. But what does Lahitalech mean? And what's the first example we have in the Torah of Lehitalech? They heard God's spirit, Mitalechet. It was going in the Gan. So what does it mean? What's the word for prayer in Hebrew? It's also uh, it's also reflexive, right? It's Lehit Palel. We have an example of Vayifalel, Pinchas Vayifalel, Vayamot Pinchas Vayifalel. So it's some sort of prayer. And Yaakov says, Ra'ofenecha lo filalti. I didn't pray for such a thing. So what's Lehit Palel? What's the, what's the reflexive mean? It means he's doing it with some introspection involved. He's doing it with himself, correct? Prayer has to be extremely introspective. That's how you find God on the inside. So it says God himself was mitalech at the beginning, and then it says part of the blessings, the opposite of the tochacha is that v'italachti v'tochachem, I shall hitalech, I will reflexively walk with you. Chanoch walk with God, and Avravin was told to hitalech im Hashem, right? That was his commandment, walk with God. So what does that mean? So here's how you know what a tzaddik does. I know I know a man who's an actual tzaddik. He carries a shivisi card. Okay, it's a little bit. Maybe Rabbi Rahim and the Rambam would have a problem with this card with the shemo and stuff like that and different pictures on it. The point is, a person who's a tzaddik is able to, and I'm not going to use the word imagine, just like come up with something. I mean, by imagine, I mean he can actually visualize it and act on it that God is with him. A tzaddik walks is mitalech with God, that means in this world, can you see God right now? How do you see God? How, how do you expect it? Well, it's, 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 it's amazing that not more people are chilonim, or more people are just like, not believers. Why? Because they could, there's all sorts of explanations. You see a natural world around us. It is not readily clear to the vast majority of people in this world throughout history, by the way, that there is such a thing as God, correct? So how does, how does a tzaddik perceive God? That's a very hard thing to do. But you've met a tzaddik. Have you met a real tzaddik? Everything they do is conscientious. And they're able actually to behave as though they know that God's looking at them. Now, you and I know, academically speaking, we read the first uh, chapter of, of uh, well, we've read Nord of Uchem. We've started Yisodia Torah, right? You have to know. Okay, Rama says to know that there is a God, not believe. You have to know it. That's a lot harder thing, right? But do you actually act on that knowledge? I'll tell you from my, my perspective. I'm not a tzaddik. So a lot of times when I, especially I come home today, I have to do busy stuff, run after the kids and just busy all day. Am I walking with God at that point? Am I conscious there's a God right here and he's with me? Have you guys gotten to that part yet? 
that's a really difficult thing to achieve. But a tzaddik is able to put God before him. You know what's interesting about that? When you have real tzaddikim like this, what do people notice about the tzaddik? Somehow you can see that God is with him. You can tell that this guy has something special around him. And you know what happens if you create a whole group of people, a whole nation of such tzaddikim who are able to perceive God? Then outsiders, even Goyim, can come and look at this people and say, God is with them. That's an amazing thing. That's that's Hashra'at Shechina. That exists sometimes, even causes physical phenomena to, to manifest. A pillar of cloud or a fire. Such a thing is possible. And that's what we're trying to achieve. And we have to get back to this. Yes, halacha is great and all these things that we're doing, that's great. But the most important thing is keeping a mitzvah improves us and helps us get to this status of the tzaddikim who can actually perceive of God in front of them. And by the way, if you, if you know that God's with you all the time and he's watching, so to speak, then it'll be much harder to do an Avera. And I only pray that th this is, for me, the hardest thing. Like, we all have Yitzhahara inside. You're not, you're not expected to get rid of Yitzhahara. It's okay that, you, that the moment you wake up in the morning, Yitzhahara turns on also. Right? Like I said, the, my, radio, my, uh, my alarm, not my radio anymore, it's alarm. I had it set for 4.55 a.m. this morning. It went off for a split second. I don't have trouble getting up in the morning, thank God. So it, thank God, trouble falling asleep, trouble waking up is not a, is not a problem. That alarm goes off. I'm awake, and I'm thinking, split second, not even. I don't know. You guys could you ever watch that counts the you know the hundredths of a second? It must be maybe five hundredths of a second. I'm thinking, why did I just do that to myself? I could have continued sleeping. A, s a slight moment of regret, subconscious. That's the Yitzhahara, and you know your own personal Yitzhahara. It's inside of you, correct? You know what your Yitzhahara is for, and you don't give into it. You know how to control your Yitzhahara. The most, the most important tool that we have in fighting the Yitzhahara is this knowledge that we are supposed to know God. You've been taught this. Know that God is with you all the time and he's watching. And if you really can perceive that, you can train yourself in that way, you will not do an Avera. And thank God we have the Torah. As Jews, it makes us a lot easier for us because we have a Torah. We have a land where we keep the Torah. It protects us. If you were stuck in, let's say, far east or the far west and you didn't have the torah it'd be a lot harder for you to ever even conceive of god in any sophisticated way right and wouldn't protect you from doing averos but we can we've been given the tools to do so and that we have to thank hashem for that so uh yeah i guess we have to do it. let's let's open up this thing let's talk about the avoda do you remember what we were discussing last week gentlemen yeah uh i'll use i have my own copy i'm using the korean copy because i took notes in it before i got these Remember, the guys who show up uh, enough times get to keep these. So there you go. Yep, safer. But this is Corbonos. We last time we opened up Corbonos, we opened uh, we started with Corn Pesach. But we're gonna jump now to uh, in the winter we did Hilchos Beis Bechira. We're gonna go to Bias Mikdash in the fourth parak now. So you guys remember what we discussed last week about going to our bias and the whole controversy. They're telling us don't go there to be a tamez. You should ask the question. What are you supposed to do? What were the olden days? What were they, what were they planning to do? I'm sure Yehuda Maccabee and his men had been around quite a few dead people recently, right? They're fighting wars. Now, that, that results in Tumat Mate, right? There's no way, there's no way around it. No, Chef likes to talk about this. When they went into the base of Mikdash, why did they say, wait, wait a week so we can all purify ourselves before we even go there? Anybody know the answer? Well, that's the basic thing. Why, why is it that, technically speaking, we could say, if we got the green light this past April and we were able to do Korban Pesach, we would have done it. But doesn't it take a week, at least at least more than a week, prepare the ashes of the paraduma and combine it with the water and then sprinkle it. It takes, it takes a week to do that. Well, actually eight days to do such a thing. A total of nine days because it's the last day of the, the person, the day the person's coming, then it's the first day it gets sprinkled. Then there's the day after the seventh day because the day gets sprinkled, he's still technically tame until the night comes. So it's basically a 10-day affair if all Am Yisrael was on board. So we would need to start this on the 4th of Nisan. So after we get the green light, let's say Erev Pesach and Dunkor Pesach. Was anybody here Erev Pesach, by the way? You know where you were? Where were you on Erev Pesach? Good. Were you waiting for Korban Pesach? Did you have a Manui? You guys were out of the country. So we are trying to have Korban Pesach this year, like many years. How are we supposed to go about doing that if we can't purify ourselves? Anybody know? Anybody look ahead in, in the book and find the answer? Well, 
It's duchuya. The tuma is duchuya b'tzibur. Tell tell your friends what that means. Basically. So. Good. So let's let's uh, let's review what they what we what we're trying to do. If tumah is dechuyah b'tzibur, the Rambam holds. By the way, the term tumah hutra b'tzibur dechuyah b'tzibur occurs in shas. That's the discussion. The Rambam paskins dechuyah b'tzibur. We're going to see the nafkamina. What's the difference between hutra b'tzibur dechuyah b'tzibur? But this is important. Let's say the the naysayers were saying that uh, to me mate, that means a person who's been contaminated by contact with the dead. Has anybody here, can anybody here honestly say they've ever been to a funeral and never been in near a cemetery or in the same building as a dead person? Yeah, what? yeah, I have. I was under the same... Uh, no, but has anybody never been there? Like, you could have someone who's grown up in the middle of nowhere, so he's never been among, never yeah, been well, near a dead know. person. Well, that's what we assume. Yeah. But I don't know. Maybe nowadays you could have a person who's been fortunate enough not to have ever been to a funeral or near a cemetery for whatever reason or in the same building. I think... Mm -hmm. I think um, they've got um, co um, Kohanim who have been um, have, um, prepared over... Yeah, they're, they're starting to do also children. Yeah. Okay. You get none, no one's here as a Kohen. But there are supposed to be people who are like that. So either way, let's assume everybody's been to a funeral. So they said, don't go to Harbaez. Why? Because... Your tmei mei says you'll be chayav kares. But what we see, what was the truth about har bias and being a tmei mei? What was what was the truth? You go on har bias if you're a tmei mei, right? But so what? What is what? If you don't go on. Yeah. Well, on Pesach, what we said is so. What is it if a tmei mei can go on har bias? Why do they tell me tmei mei can't go on har bias? What's the accurate form of that statement? A tmei mei is not allowed in the azara. The azara is the inner courtyard of the temple, and Chazal instituted that they can't go beyond the chayel. That's assuming everything's working right. But Tuma Duchyab Sibur says that when it comes time to do the Korbanon, you have a chance. Forget about that. But forget about Tumat Mate. What other forms of Tuma can a person have? Well, the most common one for men is Tumas Kerry. Yeah, no, not Zav. Men, like I said, men are not going to get, if they're healthy and they're halachic, you're not going to become a Zav ever in your life. Okay? That's from a disease they call gonorrhea. So unless you're doing something you shouldn't be doing, you will not have a zav. But it's what happens to a woman to become a nida or a zava is actually quite common. It happens. And don't forget, childbirth happens. That contaminates women. Sarat, that, that doesn't happen so much, especially if the coin doesn't, doesn't rule it, but that's usually caused by certain diseases, which are a lot less common nowadays because we have antibiotics and things like that. So you're not gonna have people with saras anymore. But tuma happens. When we say tumat duchuyah b'tzibur, by the way, we're only talking about the tumat mate. All the other forms of tumah can, uh, are, are not suspended ever. Which means that if you have a person who has both types of tumah, and he has tumat keri and tumat mate, he can't say, well, tumat duchuyah b'tzibur, like the Rambam says, I'm going to go do Korm Pesach. Why can't he do that? Because the, the tumah that he has from keri, for example, is removed by what? Immersion in the mikvah, right? The tumat duchuyah b'tzibur is talking about tumat mate, which itself only removed from a very by a very long process, which is not always available. But you can understand why the Torah gave this allowance. So let's see it inside uh, over here in Dalit Tet. It's Biat Mikdash Dalit Tet. Everybody have the place there? Okay. Right before Zion talks about the tzitz miratze. What is the tzitz? The tzitz is that golden crown like thing that the Kohen Gadol wears. And the Rambam says that the tzitz atones. Or better yet, is miratzeh. What does miratzeh mean? Miratzeh is an interesting. Vinir tzolo lechaper love means the korban is accepted. Okay, it's accepted by God. And ritsui is something does an act that allows the korban to be accepted. So mirat, that's what miratzeh means. It's a pl of rotzeh and ratzon. So the tzitz miratzeh means that this korban should not have been accepted by God for whatever reason. But the fact that the Queen Godot is dressed properly and wearing this crown like object makes it that the Korban is accepted after the fact. That's what he says in sign. The tzitz 
is miratzeh. Once again, I don't know how to translate a word like that. You know of a word like uh, the proper translation now? We've explained what the ratzot means. I don't know. You could check what Chabad.org translated, what uh, Rabbi Tauger translated. I don't think there's a term in, like this in English yet. It allows it to be accepted. Well, it's not a causative. That means lahartzot. And lahartzot in, in Hebrew now means like present a lecture, interestingly enough. I don't know what the connection is. So, either way, things that are brought as, as a korban are accepted, even though they should not have been. Okay? It'll be on Aaron's metzach. Where's his metzach? It's his forehead. Or padaha, as elsewhere in the Torah, the forehead. And Aaron will basically, he will carry the Aaron. What does it carry the Aaron? It means he'll be responsible for this. It cannot allow... Uh, this process for things that have to be eaten. That is, even though the korban, okay, will be accepted after the fact, even though there's tuma involved, if it was a type of korban that had to be eaten, consumed, who, what kind of korban are consumed, chatat, asham, shlamin, etc., whether by koanim or regular people, if it's the type of thing that has to be eaten, that won't pass. Anything that's brought with tuma and meant to be eaten is not qualified if it's brought with tuma. You guys heard this rule also? There's one exception. Let's say uh, you, 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 you violate Shabbos Peshogim. What's the, what's the atonement? Bring a korban chatat. How does that work? The Kohanim will eat some of that korban, correct? Chatat brought the Tumah, whatever that means, when everybody's contaminated, means that the chatat will be accepted by God, but the meat that the Kohanim were supposed to be eaten is disposed of. It's taken out outside of Jerusalem and burned. And the same thing with all the other korbanot that had something that had to be eaten, the part that would be eaten is burned. Major exception is, yes, this is why this is so important for us, Korban Pesach. That's what the Mishnah says explicitly. Korban Pesach, drop a tumah, eat all the meat. Go right ahead. That's what's there for. It's not one person's tumah, it's the tumah that's the chuyah b'tzibur. He's going to explain what this means. Everybody's tamay, so we bring the korbanot for everybody. That's how we do it, and that's, it's not like one person's tumah, it's the tzibur's tumah that is atoned for. It only does this, has this property that's actually on his metzah. I like this also, this, uh, I think, uh, one of your notes over there, and if you see the Machbili, he's going to have it a few pages later, all the other Rishonim who disagree. You guys see that? It's, it's going to be somewhere there. I think in one of the later halafas, it's a good thing. They actually disagree. Where does the seats have to be in order to atone for this? This means that in order to go about doing this, we wanted to bring Korban Pesach to Tuma, by the way. If we remember, it's not the right way to do it. Korban Pesach to Tuma means everybody in the majority are Tame mate. So we'll go ahead with Korban Pesach anyways. In order for this to work, the Kohen Gadol has to be standing there, dressed like the Kohen Gadol in his outfit, and wearing the seats in order for this to work. Do you need a Kohen Gadol? Technically speaking, let's say it's a, a regular Monday in the base of Mikdash. If there's no thing that they're brought to Tumah, technically speaking, the Kohen Gadol doesn't have to be attending the service at all or dressed as a Kohen Gadol. Regular Kohen fit the bill also. They could do the Abu Dhabi. But here he's saying that has to be on his metzah. And it's only concerned on his metzah when he's fully dressed. We're going to see that there's actually Rishonim who disagree with this essential point over here. Some say it, just, it's, it exists. Does the seats exist nowadays, by the way? Yeah, does it exist? What does it mean it exists here? Well, I don't know. Is the template too well? What, what does it mean it exists? If I build the seats, does it count as the seats? We're going to talk about this on Monday. This is a topic of Monday's year. What makes someone a coin double, by the way? Just that he has a coin double's outfit. If some, some Kohen puts on a coin double's outfit, does he a coin double? It was a political appointment, but it also counted the Right. Uh, you, no, it, was, it rotated throughout. Uh, and it was much like and, and also you find that they mentioned hundreds of flying to the but then you look at it, the, you know, Tosos points out, we know of men who served as coin double for a long time. So what was it? There was a technical appointment of just like for the COVID. And then there was the guy who actually did the Yavod on Yom Kippur who was the recurring coin, like Rabbi Shmuel Kohen Gadol, was there for many years. But there was someone else who had the official job all year round, but said, here, you do the upload on your Kippur, you know, and don't show up the rest of the year. Very strange. Yeah, Tosfos points this out. We're going to discuss that, Tosfos. 
it's actually implied by the Rambam doesn't agree 100 percent with the post school says that. So if you come power by us on Monday, this won't discuss. Okay, so uh, let's let's stay tuned. Kol korban she'in kavua luzman. Any korban that doesn't have a set time, a no duche luot hashabbat luot hatuma. So it cannot override Sabbath or tuma. So a toda, for example, korban toda. There's no time to bring it. A person wants to bring a korban toda, so he cannot bring it on Shabbos. It doesn't override Shabbos. Why would you think it has to override Shabbos? What's the hava mean? What does it mean a korban is overriding Shabbos anyways? It could potentially override Shabbos. The answer is, well, you do. It's kind of strange. What Name, name things I can't do on Shabbos. A malacha. Sabbath is a very holy thing. I cannot, I can't slaughter an animal. I certainly can't burn anything. I can't burn wood. I can't light candles on the Sabbath. I can't skin an animal. Yet, the Kwanim, first thing they do in the morning is they're going to slaughter an animal and then fillet this animal, cut into various pieces, skin the animal, which is, you know, of course, that's, that's malacha. Then they're going to burn various pieces on the altar. That's malachas. How do Kwanim do such a thing? The answer is God gave us the Sabbath, but when he told us do these commandments it overrides the sabbath so you would have thought well i got to bring a korban toda i have a chatas to bring so i, I can bring that on shabbos too what's the difference the quantum just did this to a lamb so why can't i do this to a goat what's the answer but you could do it tomorrow the talmud has a kavu azman what's the time of a talmud has know this by heart you know morning and afternoon okay one lamb in the morning one lamb in the afternoon except for what day no exceptions. Every single day, one lamb in the morning, one lamb in the afternoon. What's the korban of Shabbos? Well, yeah, which is the korban specifically for Shabbos. The musaf of Shabbos is two more lambs. That is the korban musaf of Shabbos is musaf Shabbos means double tummy. That's all it is. That's how the Rambam says it. He barely it's one line in the Mishnah Torah of musaf Shabbos. He barely you would have missed it if you if you don't read it closely enough. Musa of Shabbos is the most plainest of Oda. It just means double the Talmud. By the way, it's a reference. By the way, that's why we eat Lechem Mishneh. I understand that Lechem Mishneh, think about this one. What, what are they we used to tell you Lechem Mishneh means? Double Mun. But Lechem Mishneh by Mun meant you get Friday's portion plus Shabbos. Lemais on Shabbos, you have the same portion you had on Friday and every day of the week. If Lechem Mishnah meant double portion for Shabbos, you would have gotten Lechem Meshulosh, right? Triple bread on Friday for Friday, and then you have two more for Shabbos. So where's the reference? Chazal told us you have to double your bread on Shabbos. You know, Rashi and Tosfos, you have, you know, Lechem Mishnah. And also, uh, Tosfos says, so you actually eat double what you normally do, eat more on Shabbos. Where, what's, where do you get this from? Because God said, Korban Ilach Mi Le'ishai. The Korban Tabit is called God's bread for his fires. And then the Korban for Shabbos is just double that. And that's the way the Rambam has it. One lamb in the morning, one lamb in the afternoon, and between those two lambs, two more lambs done the exact same way as the first lamb and the, and the fourth lamb. Okay? So that's about Kavuah's man. That's what the Rambam is saying here. Kavuah's man is, you would have had thought that other Korbanos, just like I do these other Korbanos on Shabbos and Yontif, so too, that which I have to bring because I happen to be in Jerusalem now, this, 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 this Corbin, for whatever reason, I'll bring on Shabbos also. No. The lowest Satuma doesn't, doesn't knock away Tuma also. You have to bring a Shlamim or a Toto or a Chatos. It doesn't override the Tuma. She'im lo yikrav hayom, yikrav lemachar. It says yikrav, right? You guys have it with the pata? Yikrav? You might have different vowelizations. I'm reading from the Korean version. You're reading the Makbili. They're not... Well, okay. Not all, not all the time is it the same. Ulamachar machar. You can bring it today or uh so you can bring it tomorrow or tomorrow's tomorrow. But they say modern Hebrew Mukhra time. The Machar Machar is double uh Machar. The Khol Korban Shikavuzman, Bain Korban Sibur, Bain Korban Yahid. If it's Korban that's Kavua Luzman, whether it's done for the Tibur or for the individual, Dokhetha Shabbos with Otheta Tuma. So that overrides Shabbos and overrides Tuma. Examples Korban of the Tibur. Okay, that is korban. That is korban of zman. By the way, korban tibur that doesn't have zman is let's say par, par helam dover. The tibur committed a sin, so there's one sin offering for the entire tibur. That's not done on Shabbos because you can do that tomorrow. But the korban tibur is all its midim and musafim, etc. 
So those have a specific time. They override Shabbos. They also override the Tuba. But what's a Korban Yachid that has a specific time? Well, no, the Korban Yachid. The Kohen Gadol is a part of his Avod on Yom Kippur. And the Korban Pesach, of course. Everybody's got to bring Korban Pesach on the 14th of Nisan. There's no other to do it. If the 14th of Nisan is Shabbos, does it ever happen? The 14th of Nisan is on Shabbos? It happened last year. So it was in 2021, the year before, the time before that was, you guys might remember, it was 2008. Okay, Our calendars worked out, not on purpose, this is just a factor, the way it works out, that Lua du Roche and all these other things mean that the rarest day for Rosh Hashanah is Tuesday. And whenever Rosh Hashanah is on Tuesday, it means the previous Pesach is on a Sunday, which means Arab Pesach is Shabbos. So Arab Pesach on Shabbos is quite rare. Sometimes it happens in clusters. For those of you who study statistics, who, who of you knows your statistics guy, right? Okay. Who, was, who was the math guy? Okay, fine. So you look at it, how often it happens. It's not often, but it comes in clusters. So uh, it happened like in 2003, 2005, 2008, and then it stopped for a while. And then there's like 13 years, it doesn't happen. And before that also was like, you know, whatever. Anyways, so that's Doche Shabbos. Below Kwa Tumot Hudoche, Ela Tumat Amit Levada. Not all the tumas, just the tumat mate. Understand? Good. So let's work with this. All korbanot sibur have a have a time for it. There's no such thing as a korban sibur that doesn't have a specific time necessarily. So there you go. They all they all override the tuma. Now this is an important thing because this is a response to those people who are saying not go to harabayas. Even if they were correct, stay away from our bias. Here to me, means they're not correct, right? They're saying don't go to Azara. Finally, admit, fine, you can go on to our bias, just stay away from the chil. Do we want to stay away from the chil for to me, mate? The answer is no. You know why? Because tomorrow morning, God willing, is a Friday. You know what we could do tomorrow morning? You have a korban tamid. You're going to say, but yeah, but no one tomorrow morning will be pure from Tumat Mate. Why? It takes a week to at least to purify, as we said before. We, even if we had the ashes of the Paraduma, it would take a while to purify. So they could say, you have no business doing that. And the answer we tell them is, no. We go on our bias anyways if we're Tumat Mate, because the actual halacha is, is if we're trying to do the avoda, we're trying to put the Mizbeach back in its place and do the Korban Tamid, then we don't have to care about this halacha. There's a mitzvah to be done, and it's doche the tumah. They're going to say, yeah, but you're not doing anything. Were we doing korban tamid this afternoon? But, but was was it saying, well, if we had the chance, would we have done it? I don't know about you, but I, is someone willing to step up? Are people ready to do such a thing? Yeah. Yes. Well, they say perhaps be the evidence or not okay a lot of things they say like how do you do hakil guys so when's hakil coming up this year it's going to be so you know they, the the Adarit has a whole book he says you know it talks about the melech in the azara etc but you know what let's say there's no king let's say the king's illiterate does it have to be the king does that have to be in the azara all these other things basically argues that None of it's ma'akim. You can't do it the, the ideal way so to have someone else do it. In the times of, let's say, Yeshua, they, they got to a, a hakel, did, I don't know, when did Yeshua die? How soon after they put up Mishkan Shilas did Yeshua pass away? I have to look this up. When they stopped keeping Shemitah and Yovels and all that, so they would have done it in year eight. So who did hakel during the times of Osniel ben Kanaz or Shimshon? How did they do hakel in the olden days? Well, it would have been the show fate, right? The show fate, okay, maybe. Who knows? They, they privilege him. They have the din of a king, but who says it's the king has to do it? The Mishnah says. The Mishnah implies it's already monarchical. We're going to get to this halacha also. It says, uh, we'll, we'll discuss this now. Ein yeshiva ba'azara ela l'malche beis David bilvad. Translation. You're not allowed to sit in the azara. The only people who are allowed to do so are Davidic kings. That's a halacha. It seems to be a doraisa. Did Moshe Rabbeinu come down from Sinai and say, oh, by the way, it's forbidden to sit in the Azar unless you're a Davidic king? 
there were no Davidic kings. So how did, what did that, what, how did that halacha have form? What was, how did that halacha, how was it formulated before this? Whoever Hashem chose. Or did, did it say that, so whoever's the current king? And once, I, w- I would believe that it's more like this rule that once God chooses someone, they will have this privilege. God will eventually reveal this, this privilege. What is that, some, what is that like? It says God will choose someone to be king. Now, how do you know someone has to be king, by the way? The Navi comes and says, just like, how do you know? It says the place God shall choose. How do they know where to put the, the Mishkan and Shiloh or where, you know, the Yushalayim is the place? Because the Navi comes and tells them. So apparently it is connected to the, the, the Indian of Bechira. Once God says, this man is chosen, so he has the right to do it, which means Navkamina, Shaul had the right to sit in the Azara of Mishkan Nov, for example. Because at the time he was God's chosen. How do you know? It says God chose him. But then also says what? How was he de-chosen? It says he was rejected and someone else was chosen. It actually used the word rejection, ma'as. That's the opposite of Bechira. So really, the halachic formulation until that point was just the one who's chosen by God gets to sit in there. And how do you know? You have to have a Navi certify this person. But it's not like that. It was the form, the formulation. Like it says, the, the fourth brach of benching. What's it about? It says, who, 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 put it, who put it there? Did we say Birkat Amazon? What? Uh, no, sorry, the third bracha. It's the third bracha. No, it's not Ezra and Nehemiah. It says that David and Shlomo made the bracha, but it counts as the Yeshua Yoshua made this bracha, the second one, when they finally entered the land. It says, though he knew, eventually say this bracha. So they had this thing that one day there will be something added to benching. <clears throat> Someone will be chosen. There'll be a chosen city. There'll be a chosen group. But it just hadn't happened yet. <clears throat> you understand? It, mu- it must be that that was the case. There was some sort of, there's going to be something happening. By the way, the Rambam says this as much. The, the Rambam says that there was a tradition among, you know, like one man in every generation type of thing passed on that the place of the Mikdash was always meant to be in Jerusalem. They like people, select individuals knew this, but it wasn't like public knowledge. But it was a tradition that they had. It also, it's how to pronounce God's name, for example. That's something you pass on one student to another. You don't tell everybody. It's not something you teach to everybody. But it's always a, a living tradition about how to do so. Correct? So in this case also, apparently they knew about it. It was top secret information. That's how David Amel found the base of Mikdash. He went to show on Shmuel Navi. Said, now let's find it. So, you know, he, he put in his effort to go look for it. You know, oh, I think I found the answer. Is it? Look on a map. Is it that spot? And the Navi goes and tells him, Hashem says you're correct. You found it, but you have to also do your own loot. By the way, David Melch wasn't sitting around saying, God, choose me to be king. There's a certain effort that went into being chosen. Yeah, God was going to choose someone. Just like Avram Avinu. Who could have been chosen before Avram Avinu? Pirkevos, right? Anybody could have stepped up before Avram Avinu. They're, they're, they're select individuals. It could have been Shame himself. We saw who was the first, who was the first Avram Avinu, the first potential Avram Avinu in history who fits the bill. Like ha- has the, fir- the first permutation of, of the of the Nuvua to shame. shame. It could have been Yoktan, Peleg's brother. How do you know that? Because he's Aver's son. Okay, and he has twelve sons. Okay, Yoktan, God will make him small, and so he has twelve sons, just like all of Avramvinu's descendants. Okay, everybody connected to Avramvinu has twelve sons. To show that they had the chance. It says God offered the Torah to the, you know the Ishmaelites, Esau, etc. They rejected, not to the Egyptians, not to Canaan. People connected to Avram Vinu, so he was the one who stepped up. But there was a chance, like David Amalek's older brother, God rejected him. He, had, he, was, he was first in line for this possibility. Back into the text. Let's see this. The whole korban mayhem shekarav betuma eno ne'echal. All of these korbanot that are brought betuma are not eaten. Ela maktirin mimeno devarim arin lak Torah. What does that mean? We burn on the altar the parts that are meant to be burned on the altar. What's burned on the altar? <laughs> Forbidden fats, the entrails, etc. Well, no, some limbs are not. The things that are meant to be eaten, if it's the limb that contains meat to be eaten, that's not put on the mispeah. But basically, anything that has the parts that are supposed to be burned, something about specific, like a hot dog, if, if it's a burnt offering, everything's on the mispeah, except for the skin. And if it's a sin offering or not, or things like that, there are specific parts that don't go on the mispeah and some specific, specific parts that, that do go on the mispeah. Vashar Rui Lachila Nisraf. The rest that would have been fit for eating is burned, just like actual meat of a kosher korban that becomes contaminated. Don't touch 
meat. It's very easy to contaminate sacrificial meat, by the way. That's why you have to put your hands in the mikvah before touching a korban. Actually, you have to put your hands in the mikvah. You guys do that? Anybody ever do that? Mikvahized hands? Yeah. Well, yeah, you wish. To do korban pesach, you have to go to the mikvah and dunk your hands in the mikvah also. You have to go to the mikvah the day of, but that night after shul, when you come home to the seder, you know, you, you're gonna you're gonna bring corn paste off to the table. The guy who's got that, that platter has to put his hands on the mikvah. Yes, there is the tilas to dine for karpas, but before the tilas to dine for karpas, you have to put your hands on the mikvah just to go to the seder. Isn't that wild? It's not part of the seder to the, leave the table. Why why is it that we don't have in the seder? Anybody looked studied how to do corn paste off with a corn paste off? The seder paste off with a corn paste off. It's almost the same seder. It's a little bit different. I think I tried to show some of you guys this. So there's a part, motzi matzah, right? Before motzi matzah, there's uh, 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 rachza, right? That's to eat the, the, the matzah. Because you already washed your hands to eat the karpas. Where do you dunk your hands in the mikvah in order to eat korban pesach? Why don't they just say instead of rachza for to eat for bread, dunk your hands in the mikvah and that will cover the, the, the bread and the korban pesach? What's the answer? Well, it's before everything. In order to be able to handle Corbin Pesach, to bring it to the table, remember that's the first, one of the first steps is bringing the Corbin Pesach to the table. You got to make sure your hands are pure. You have to go to Mikvah the day before, and after you come up to Corbin Pesach, you dunk your hands in the Mikvah. Very important thing. And then make sure not to touch anything. You, know, you could ruin your hands. So, uh, yeah, this is uh, this thing that we've, we've forgotten, and uh, that's why we have to. Immediately start learning these halachot so we can keep them. Even if tumah hutra b'tzibur or dechuyah b'tzibur, sorry, it doesn't get over. We, we cannot get around this this issue that we have to put our hands up the mikvah before handling uh, kodashim, sacrificial food. Okay. Kitzad docher atumah. How does dechiyat tumah work? He giyaz mano shel tuar korban vayu rov akal shemak rivo tot tbeim lemeit. Doesn't even say am Yisrael here. You notice that? Doesn't say Amisro. What does it say? Time to bring the Korban. Give me an example. Time to bring Korban Pesach. Ram says specifically regarding Korban Pesach. Let's say tell me tomorrow morning. Rova Am Shemak to Bim Lamate. How many people are attending Korban Tamid on a Wednesday in the middle of Tammuz? In the base of Mikdash times. Well, there's the Mahamodos people. I'm sure there's quite a few people. It's not like it's a holiday. That's for sure. It's not a holiday. Well, they're just like, you know, thank God there are people who are pious. A lot of people have connections to the Kotel. There are people daven every every field they can at the Kotel. They go all the time to the Kotel. I admire their commitment. And it's a very Jewish thing they're doing. They're just misled, like we said last week. They're hanging out in the parking lot of the Mikdash. But they don't know any better. To them, that's their commitment. So there will be people, just like today nowadays, you met people on Harbai, some activists. They're there every single day. You're probably surprised by the colorful types of people they have. There's all the people. I, I, I only met uh, Rabbi Levy uh, during the corona. All the times I went before, I never saw him. You know why? Because his time to go was a little bit later than the time I always tried to go. If I ever went, I went first thing in the morning. But he can't go first thing in the morning. There's always the characters who are there first thing in the morning. And then there's the 9 o'clock in the, in the morning characters. There's the afternoon characters. So now that I go at different times, I'm able to see who else is involved. You know, But if you're first thing, you, you see that, that group. So there will be a group of people there in the base of Mikdash there. It says, Rova Am, Rova Kahal Shemak Rivimoto to me. You don't have to count all of Am Yisrael. You have 100 people. Let's say it's rainy, by the way. A rainy day. Cold, rainy morning in Teves, in the base of Mikdash. In the Kohanim, what's a Kohen dressed in? He's wearing a linen tunic and linen boxer shorts and a hat and, and, and a belt. It's a little bit cold, like the Ramam says. It's, it's not the most pleasant thing. So they have a few quantum on duty. This one will walk out and do a little slaughtering, maybe work for two minutes in the cold rain, and he's going to take a break, and someone else will take over for him. So you don't have a lot of Kohanim. You definitely don't have a lot of regular Israel or Levium on duty, maybe the minimum, a minimum crowd, right? So all you have to do is count the people there, Rov HaKahal. Then say Rov Kohanim here. This means who? The Kahal, the regular people. They're Tmeim. So what do we do? Osho Kahal Torim Vayu Koni Makrim Tmeim Tmeim Lemeim. Don't look at the, the, the Kahal, look at the Kohanim. How many Kohanim take are, are on duty on any given day? I don't know. I haven't seen exact numbers about this. It's not the majority of Kohanim. The Kohanim are divided into Mishmarot that you know work on certain weeks. And the days of the week are divided among six groups, but they of. 
you know, six subgroups, like houses of the father, as they call them. So it's not a lot of Kohanim on duty that day. If majority of them are Tmei Mate, by the way, how do they know that? What are they doing there? If it's Tmei Mate can't even come inside, how do they do this? How do they make this determination? It's usually before they open up the doors. Before they open up in the morning, there are people who are not in the Azara, correct? Where are the Kohanim and Levim? There's some Kohanim in the courtyard. They're the overnight on guard duty, not so many. There are Levim outside on guard duty. There are Kohanim in that dormitory place, the Beit Mokade, where they have the fire going all the time. And then there's the Jews waiting outside the main gates for the Levim to open up. So this is basically before sunrise. This is the early morning hours. They basically start counting, like Rav Kapach writes, when they do Korm Pesach. They actually have to ask the, the assembled people before they open up the doors and all that, is anybody here Tomei? And normally it would say, look at this. There's Everybody here is pure. You five guys are Tomeim. What do you, you think you have a chance to even get into the base of Mikdash? You were at a funeral two days ago. You haven't gotten, you haven't had, even started the Paraduma process yet. Why do you even have a Havim? You can come in here. The answer is, like Rav Kapach pointed this out, there was some good chances that they, the people knew that it is likely that the majority of the call or the majority of Kohanim who could potentially be on duty that day are to may mate. And they actually have to do a whole hand count by a show of hands who's pure and who's impure. And if the impures win, they just go ahead with the service. That's kind of amazing. And Rav Kapach points this out in three places. You even count the women. Because women count just as equally in Korb Pesach. And there was no Mechitza, but they did Korb Pesach in the Azara. And the women, and even I guess the slaves, <coughs> Evik Nani counts the Jews. There are many people like that. It wasn't no standing, standing only in the Azara. But Rav Kapach points us out, like I said, three places. The women are just as 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 obligated as the men, so they count the women also. Who is to, who is to me mate and who's not? So this was a normal thing. This isn't that the way the naysayers are trying to tell you we're all to me mate. Go away. On the contrary, it's good for all to me mate. You know why? We don't have to go through this process of making this determination. If we could rely on this assumption, which is a very good assumption, that most adult Jewish men have become to be made at a certain point, whether Kohanim, Levim, or Yisraelim, and the women included in this, then we could just go ahead with going into the base of Mikdash and doing what we need to do already. So the, 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 the other guys are, are doubly wrong. Aside from the fact that they're, that they're miscommunicating the extent of the Isur, that it's all of Harabayit, and therefore don't go into Harabayit because you're Tmei Mate. It's, by the way, like I said, the Azara or the Chael, it actually is good. It's a it's a heter if everybody's Tmei Mate to go into the uh, in the Mikdash. It makes things much easier. Oh yeah, so after we go on like this, ask the question. Let's say tomorrow, God willing, we start the Korban Tamid. We're all Tmei Mate. Could we say, you know what? This makes it a lot easier. Let's just continue being Tmei and continue with this temple service, it'll lead us all the way to Passover even. We'll even have Passover, but Tuma. Is that proper? Of course not. That's one of the Raman things. It's like, but you still have to try to get the Paraduma ashes as soon as possible. Who did this, by the way? What's the what's the historical, uh, 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 what do you call it, uh, historical incident this involves? One more time, the Maccabees. Why were they looking for the coin double seal, like some un uncontaminated olive oil. But they were all contaminated anyways. It's preferable. There you go. Technically speaking, they found contaminated oil. They could have used that. They're just touching the oil, they're contaminated. They found one guy who's not contaminated, so he was able to pour the oil into the menorah. But everything else is contaminated. The answer, that's preferable. Whatever you could do, but, but, but Tara, one of them gives the answer. What's the, the base Yosef's kasha? Why, why, why eight days, right? And finding the oil. How many terusims to the Beis Yosef's kasher are there? Well, the Beis Yosef asks, why eight days? Okay, that's his kasher, whatever he has. So, it's one of the, it's one of the issues there, that it's better to do whatever you can, but the Torah, it's a mitzvah. It's only dechuya b'tzibur, it's b'tiavad. But we're still trying to do it, but, uh, you know, l'chad <clears throat> chila. i pour myself a drink. So, this is something that, if, if only everybody was aware of this halacha, then uh, it would make things a lot easier, especially politically. We wouldn't be bashing people and saying that all oh, these hard biased people are causing us problems. This is what Am Yisrael needs to do. Guys, questions yet? No? No one's bothered by anything?
for us, apparently it's 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 not parabias, you know, on that on that side, the south side. But uh, you know, if you tell people that, then the only way to access that eroding expansion by by you know by walking is going through the part that's actually harbias anyways, correct? So there's no real nafkamina. Maybe God willing, in the future, who knows? We're gonna see that there's a well, we actually saw this last year in the winter, that there's a way to expand the Kadusha of Harbias, and there's a way to expand the Kadusha of Jerusalem, correct? So they might just expand the Kadusha all the way that way. And maybe not. Maybe it's a good thing that they leave it unofficially unsanctified, okay? Un unsanctified, so that they could use it for certain purposes. Lama uh, Davardume, we're speaking about the Arava, the area that's part of the state of Israel, south of the Dead Sea on the way to Elam. Why is it good that that place might not be halachically Eretz Israel or, or, or sanctified as Eretz Israel? How do we benefit in that way? Yeah, so the Shemitah doesn't apply there. Oh yeah, we want to, we're trying to get out, we're finding loopholes to get out of, out of Shemitah? That, or that, or that the, the poor people, especially, it saves, it saves money. It's an important thing. So it's good that there's certain parts of Eretz Israel that we control, but they're not halachically Eretz Israel. And the sages talk about this. So it would be good if there's an area of Harabayas that doesn't have the Kedusha of Harabayas because then we can enjoy Kulas there. So that's a good thing. I guess. The thing is, can you, can you do a Shtat Havaya there? Is it considered one contiguous floor? It's a good question. Where If the floor is contiguous, like we saw in the Rambam, there's uh, the things that open up into, into the Kodesh, the doors and all that, and the roofs are contiguous. It might be a good question if you do that. You guys saw that basically in the rough demonstrated this, that where are you allowed to bow down? Where are you not allowed to bow down? You can't bow down on cut stone, correct? But it says in the Mikdash you can't. So we hold the halacha that Mikdash means all of Harabayas. And so if you're bowing down on stone that's outside of Harabayas, that's Navera. So this area obviously is paved with stone. So can you bow down there or not? That's a good question. Very good question. If it's considered mikdash and harabayas, so you can bow down there. If it's not a lovely mikdash, so you have to tell people, don't bow down there unless you put out, you know, grab one of those mats that they hit. Thank God they put a lot of mats there, right? A lot of mats there for some reason. So that helps. Yeah. Yeah. If you be like outside, confines of what? When you say kutlamachne, which machna are you referring to? Certain things have to be out of machna and levia. That's that's hard bias. Certain things have to be machna shtino. That's the azar. And certain things have to be out of the machna, machna is all of Jerusalem. So, look, it's good. It's it, we have to be aware of these lines. Like the Rambam says, third time around, they're going to re-sanctify the land, redraw the borders. They're going to redraw the borders of Jerusalem and all the walled cities. They can potentially redraw everything. It's all of the decision, by the way, Chazal. Chazal means the ones who cast away already. The Quran of Rafa. Sanhedrin makes these determinations. And it's a good thing. You know why? Because Sanhedrin, when asked to determine what was, they're not just throw up their hands like, oh, we're Basafic. We don't know. You know, we can't. They have to decide. And what they decide, that is the Halacha, the Raisa. So we're not so worried about these questions. I like that question. We saw those, like, should have kept the list of running questions, how to rebuild the base of Mikdash. We saw, do you remember seeing those maps? The Rambam's map of the outline of the base of Mikdash and where all the rooms go is different than the other Mepharshim. Compare the, the map that they have here on this side, in this book, or in the Makbili, with, let's say, the one Kahati has for the way the outlay of the second base of Mikdash. It's entirely different. You guys saw the thing? The second base of Mikdash was a gigantic 100 by 100 Amma cube, or was it the classical look? The T. Uh, the Rambam is unique. He says it wasn't the way that everybody imagines it. He imagines this big cubicle ba base of Mikdash. Slightly cubicle, a little bit wider toward the front, like maybe 101 amas toward the front. So it's trapezoidal from the bird's eye view. But it still looks like, you know, it still looks like a gigantic cube. You guys seen the pictures? The Rambam's cubicle base of Mikdash? Look at this. Okay, this is saying we saw the, the serum. Yeah, serum. Look at this. They have a beautiful illustration. That is the Mikdash as you have it in classical understanding. Based on, you know, look, there's a lot of testimony this way. This is basically how most people understand the Mishnayas and Roman testimony, you know, everything else that you find there. And up top you have basically artists' rendition of the way Rambam describes the base of Mikdash. The Rambam in his Savyad 
showed you that the floor plan of the base of Mikdash, from the bird's eye view, is square, and it's 100 amas up, basically it results in a, a cube. 100 by 100 by 100 amma cube. You see this picture? That's a good question. The Rambam says you have to rebuild it that way. The third base of Mikdash is to be built that way also. Big question that needs to be resolved. Otherwise, we can't go forward. Uh, that, that's not such a biggie. Uh, really? Is it Ma'ake? It doesn't seem to be that way. We saw also that sugi. You guys know the sugi? Okay, review review the sugi from the winter. It seems that the Rambam wasn't saying Dafka has to be this way, by the way. He was drawing a schematic. Not only that, all the evidence indicates, <clears throat> both from people saw the menorah, Jews and non-Jews alike, all the evidence from then, back then, shows that everybody who's familiar with the menorah drew with rounded rounded arms. Right? That should be obvious. The Goyim depicted it that way. The Jews depicted that. How did the Goyim depict it? Arch of Titus. How the Jews depict it? All the coins that they dig up and all the symbols of the menorah from Jews in Second Temple times. And they saw the menorah. You can't say, well, not every Jew got to go into the Kodesh. The answer is, we're going to say, sometimes they even pushed into the Kodesh. And that was a holiday ritual that they had is they brought out the Kalim to show to the Jewish people. And it wasn't just one menorah. First base of just had 11. The temple, they, second temple, they had three. You know, it was, there was quite a few of them around. <clears throat> so let's move on. So it says here that people have to do this thing. You have to count who is, who's Tomei and who's not. <coughs> Next. Oh, Shahayu, Elu Ve'elu Torah, Ve'ayu, Klea Sharei Tamim Lameit. Look at this one. Everybody, all the people are are, are uh, pure, but what's Tamei now? Klea Sharei's. How did that happen? Answer, they put all the Kalim in a room. Okay? All the Kalim are in storage. How many Kalim are in Basin Mikdash? Many. By Kalim, I mean the ones that use the cups of catching blood and uh, the incense pans. They're all kept in, in one nice decorative storage room in the base of Mikdash overnight. And there's a bunch of Kalim that are not kept in the storage room. Those are the Kalim that are actually in the Kodesh. That's the Shulchan, the Menorah, and the Katoris altar, but it was actually connected to the ground, so that's not the Kabbalah Tumor. So that's all you have. In the actual Kodesh, you have two main Kalim, the big golden Menorah and the big golden Shulchan. And then all the other Kalim. How is it possible that those are all suddenly, one morning, they are Tomei and they're not good for service, yet everybody's pure? Yes. If a Kohen was killed in, in, in the Machsan, or a Kohen died in, in the Kodesh for whatever reason, did a Kohen ever die in the Kodesh? Yes. Okay? The best example of the Kohanim, the first, as a matter of fact, the first two Kohanim to ever go into the Kodesh also died in the Kodesh, which are Nodav and Avihu. They died in the Kodesh. Does that contaminate the Ohel Moed or the actual edifice of the temple? No. It's a building. It doesn't contract too much. So that, that happened right away. This thing that the halacha that happens says the, the Kohen who discovered or could have discovered where the Ark of the Covenant was hidden was killed miraculously before he could say anything. And there's a terrible story about sometimes the Kohanim were off the derech. says they, they actually resulted and they stabbed each other fighting over who can get what, what privilege. Or they pushed each other off the Mizbeach. Remember, Mizbeach is how high? Well, it's as high as a two-story building, right? That's how tall the Mizbeach is. There's no banister on the Mizbeach, and there's a there's a there's that ramp that goes up there. You could fall off that if you know, if you go close to the edge. That happened once. People got hurt in the Mizbeach. Or you could be the Kohen who rebuked the people in the first temple times, and what they do? Zechariah ben Yehoyada became a Navi. He rebuked Am Yisrael in the Mikdash. He was a Kohen at the time. What happened to him? They lynched him. So yes, Kohanim have died in the base of Mikdash before. Many famous examples. And also when the temple was destroyed, obviously, they were, they were killing Kohanim there. So it is quite obvious that this halakha, unfortunately, has precedent in reality. So what do you do? Everybody's, everybody's pure, but all the Kalim are Tomei. So what do you do? So read the halakha. What's the halakha? Everybody's pure. Go ahead with the avoda. Betuma. Vitaskubo atmin batorim kechad vikatsu kulan la azara. Remember, the, the, this whole raise your hands, everybody who's, who's Tomei and Tahor happens beyond the actual Azara because that's where they can't go. They're waiting within the hill, they're waiting on our bias. They, they do show of hands who's Tomei and who's Tahor. All the Tomei to one side, all the Tahor to one side, they can just see who's, who's more. And once they realize they're going ahead with this, the Kohana may be making an announcement, blow the chauffeur an hour before sunrise. Everybody, all the Kim are Tomei. Everybody, most of the Kohanim are Tomei. Everybody, we see that only a minority of you are wearing white, indicating that you're that you're pure, 
right? People are pure wear white. Everybody else is showing up in regular clothes. We are going through today's temple service, Batuma. And it's like uh, it's like when you go to the beach and they have the black flag up. Okay, you don't take your kids to the, to the beach, but there's a thing at the beaches here. You go to the beach first thing in the morning where it's nice and you know, quiet and it's, you know, it's, it's, uh, you know it, it's private and all that. But the lifeguards have certain areas where you can't swim, jellyfish, riptides, etc. They cordon off a whole area of the beach and there's a whole side up here swimming only a, a available at this point or you know whatever restrictions they have. The Gohana basically have the red flag going or something, some indication. Tuma rules are suspended today. We're going through the Tuma. And therefore, if you are Tame, welcome in. We're not stopping you from coming to the Mikdash. Amazing. But that's what the Allah is. Yeah. So people are allowed in. It turns out Jews have the right to attend the service. That's why it says Yom Kippur. What does it say at the beginning of the Mishnahis in Yom Kippur? The Avodah is Kohen Gadol. Kohen Gadol shows up in the Azar to do the, the Avodah. What's going on there? You remember what it says in the Mishnah? It says you'd find that the Azar is already full of Jews there for the Yom Kippur service. Can't keep them out. I think I put out a message to the Machon Shiloh group. This is the Misa. You, they're, they're, they're preventing Jews from going to Harabayas. They have a long line of Goyim from all over the place who should not be going. They shouldn't even be in this country. They have no, unfortunately, Goyim have no right to be in Eretz as long as we don't keep Shemitah in Yeovil. You're not allowed to have them coming in there. So they're online to go into our bias. You have the right to cut them. Cutting someone online at the grocery store or to get on the bus or anywhere else and cutting other Jews or cutting people in Hutzlars anywhere, cutting is an Avera. It's Genevas Man and someone's Genevas Das. But getting in the way of those people who are trying to go into our bias is the same thing as you walking into your, the front door of your house and other people blocking your way. You walk past them and they have no right to be there. They should not be there. So you can just go to the front of the line, and that's what they, they should also understand that. Not that the Jews have to, you know, only are allowed at certain times and they're restricted and they have to go through a security check. It's the exact opposite. They should give the right of way to the Jews, and they should make way for us. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, I'm going to twist this um, Okay, uh, go ahead. Did you say the same thing about people who are not dressed well, uh, in a way to indicate public uh, Yeah, that's a problem. You can't do that because you can't insult people. There's also the vote of Brio. Avert your eyes. But yes, there's they, they how are we gonna how are we gonna they have no right to be there? Yeah, they should not be there modestly. But this is the major problem. The silver lining, Rabbi Victor Miller, you can find some of this farm here, very uh ballistic Haredi, probably opposed to most of the things we're doing now. He said it's a good thing, let's say, that the Muslims are in charge. Why? Because they don't allow all the shenanigans that go on at the Kotel. The Kotel has people dressed modestly. It has these feminists making them up. You know, that if, if we would open up the... What? Well, yeah, it's... If, if Hospice Shalom Harbias was run like the Kotel, we'd have problems. We can't open up Tommy Store like this. And that's why, by the way, they, they say don't go up there because there are people who are not going to make fun. There are people who are dressing improperly. What do we do about them? We have to, like I said, lead by example. Try to avoid those types of people. I discovered that the last time I went to base, uh, the base of Mikdash, there were people who like, when you go at 7 o'clock in the morning, it's only, you know, people who are there to daven. It's mamish, you know, good people. You're more likely to run into women, which is a problem. You're more likely to run into others. You know, so yeah, we have to deal with this, but we have to educate. And uh, we can't go around telling women how to dress. That's a, that's a hard thing. We have to teach them. We hope, we hope that they have mothers who teach them how to dress. Yeah. What did Rav Shlomo Zaman Arbach do? I heard a, maybe it's an apocryphal story. It used to be, woman gets on the bus, she's immodest. What do, what do the Panayim do? They yell at her, they scream at her, they throw stuff at her, right? What did the, what did the Rav do when, when the woman got on the bus who was dressed immodestly? He got off right away, as though it was his stop. You understand? If you're in a place where people are immodest, you know, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's an eye issue, sorry, then what do you do? Get yourself out of there. I think they were sending out warnings also. It could very well be many people have tried to go up to our bias, and whatever reason, they just don't let them. They have a whole group going. They just make them wait for an hour. They used to do this more often. You have to go there, and, and, and unfortunately, in the situation, know that you might not succeed in, in visiting the base of Mikdash when you intend to. Something might come up and will stop you. And if it's a group of immodestly dressed people, 
and it, it's such it's such a bad thing. Aside from the fact that it's a, that's a desecration of the place, it's actually preventing you from going. Then you have to say that okay, God God allowed this to happen. It was a sign He didn't want you to go today. It's like when it rains on Sukkot, right? You tried, but you know you can't you can't succeed at everything. Does that answer the question? Yeah. Sometimes you don't say it. Become become a father. Sometimes you don't get to do everything you plan. Actually, yeah. I was thinking about the, this reason they come. Yeah. Like, oh, the real reason they want to—they don't want to open it up because they, they want to keep like the pool is out of there. Yeah. It's like I don't know how to respond to this. Respond, respond to, to that. And that. Like, real, really, that's like their best argument against, uh, against us. I'm not saying they're they're right. I have, I'm on up today, but. Like how do we respond? Like just educate them? I don't know if that's enough. We have to educate that. We, the, the Jews were given the Torah. You have to study the Torah every day. We have responsibility to spread the Torah to everybody. To so those people who want to listen, look, it's a good thing. We're, le- we're learning halachas right now. Halacha, sukkah, and the Rambam. We're teaching it. We're learning it. We're seeing it inside. That's good. Most of Am Yisrael are not here right now learning these halachas. So we have to be, lead by example. That's how modesty works, by the way. Well, a lot of modesty, especially for women in their dress, is low self-esteem. Why do women dress certain ways? No, to draw attention. My wife likes to tell women about this. A woman who's confident in herself in relationships, girls who grow up, you know, balanced, do not need to expose themselves in public on a regular basis. The women who feel that they need attention, so they do things to get attention. And the, the way women get attention is by dressing or presenting themselves so you have they have to get the right positive attention they have to understand about themselves the Rama says it's the most undignified thing to expose oneself clothing is a great thing it's good to wear clothing for men and for women by the way and the less clothing people wear the more they're debasing themselves the more they're making themselves like animals so we have to lead by example yeah you hope that people eventually realize dress like you want to like you're supposed to dress very important thing let's finish this we'll, we'll close this halakha here i want to tell you something inside outside i remember years ago one of the rabbanim formative in in my times who i guess also is not a, he's in gullis and he's definitely not a torah or Israel type of rabbi so I we used to use the the Shiloh sitter. You ever see the Shiloh sitter, the blue sitter, like in America before art school? It was the kind they used to give us in elementary school as a sitter presentation. The old sitters didn't have the line in the sitter in Aleinu Shehem Ishtahawim Laheva Warik. You know what that line is? All the good sitters have it. Art school at least put it back in. What is that line about? It was censored out, so you could have all my father's sidurim before art school, never even had this. Don't mention it, that was taken out. And some places, they still did say it. They say Elena all the time. So I asked the rabbi, I said, a machlokas, the chazal and the pope, who do we paskin like? That sounds like a Shiva's question. Machlokas, chazal and the pope, who do you paskin like? He looks at me, he's like, chazal. I said, so why aren't you saying the line, shame shtachavim have a reek. The pope took that out. Correct? Rabbi Achim is talking about this, censor texts. So, oh, Taka, you're right. You know, that, that's a good argument. Machlokas, the Rambam and the Waqf, who do we hold like? Yeah, you're going to say who the answer? No, it's a religious question. Oh, the answer is the Rambam. Yeah. What do I ask this question? Because Rambam Paskins, you should go to Harabayas. The Waqf is the one. When you say like this, it's old Machlok, it's Moklos. Rabbanim today Matir, Rabbanim today Aser. Say yes, that's an old Machlok. It's the Machlok, the Rambam, and the Waqf. Because the Waqf, they're the ones who created the whole Isser. People write in the newspaper. My daughter just showed me. Hold, it's it's the front page thing. Machlokas, Rabbi Weber's there, and the the Matirim and all that. And this one guy, right? No, it's bad. You can't. Everybody knows the Chola Dorot. Everybody know how Gubazet Isser Chola Dorot. Well, no, not the Chola Dorot. The last five hundred years, No Gubo Isser. Where'd they get that from? They got it from the Waqf. They didn't get it from Rishonim. They didn't get it from the Gemara. They didn't get it from the Mishnah. This is mostly Allah Psukah the Ram is quoting here. There's no Machlokas here. Yeah, what's the question? Someone, if you're called up to the Shabbat Seabor, can you say uncensored? Uh, I don't know what you're It depends on who's Seabor. If you're the Shaliach, yeah. if you're the Shaliach in the Bell's synagogue, yeah. so the Belzers are sending you as their Shaliach, use their sitter. Otherwise, you're not doing their, your job as Shaliach. And if you don't want the Shalichut to do as they said, then don't take it. And if you know you think you're doing right, like adding the words that were censored out, if they're going to be upset at you, you should have talked it out beforehand, like negotiate with them. You want me to be your shaliach, I'd like to say the following words. And if they disagree, then you don't have to be their shaliach. And if they're on your territory, 
then you should show them, I'm going to use this sitter. And lo and behold, this sitter is a little classical. It's more closer to the way things were. That's all you do. But you know, like, that's an important thing by being a shliach. Make sure you know who you're, you're shlichus. Keep your shlichus. What does that mean, by the way? Well, it means you can't, you can't say, like, I was, I was just a shliach. Okay? You're a shliach. Know what you're doing. You have, you have a brain. Okay? Don't, don't turn off your brain. Ain't shliach and varvir means I was just following orders. There's no such thing. Okay? You're a shaliach, know what shlichut you have. And if you don't want the shlichut, then do not take the shlichut. Good, okay, I guess it brings us to this, whatever. We have to go to sleep. I don't know what you guys have to do. You guys are everybody here, dude. It's, in yeshiva, guys stay up until midnight, right? They have chillin' now. Finish the pizza. We'll see you guys next week. We would like to encourage our viewers to share these videos with friends and send in your responses. If you would like to obtain Birkon Nusach Eretz Yisrael or invite the rabbi for a speaking engagement, please email us at office at machonchilo.org.